Anyway, so thank you guys again for coming and thank you to our guests. So this is based, as far as I understand, is based on a joint work, also with uh, amazing Claudio Calosi. <laughs> unfortunately, couldn't come. You all know Claudio Calosi. Um, so this is based on a joint work. Uh, the title of the talk is A Chair for Minkowski, and the speakers are wonderful Damiano Costa and amazing uh, Alessandro Cecconi. So the talk is going to last for 45 minutes and then we're going to have a Q&A session. So please. So let, let me start on a somber news. Unfortunately, Carl, Claudio couldn't come. So I will, I will leave like one minute for everyone who's come to, to see Claudio to just exit. Feel free to leave. Right? Yeah, exactly. Here, because please. Claudio is not we here. We understand. Yeah, we would understand anyway. But, so so th th this work is, is a joint work from me, Damiano, and Claudio, and it, is, it concerns the metaphysics of ordinary objects within relativity, and the idea is to find or refine, uh, since, I mean, we already have ordinary objects, then the relativity came, but so the idea is how can we recover ordinary objects within relativity theory? So as you might know, relativity theory is a very revisionary theory about space-time that has a number of consequences. And this consequence seems to somehow affect our conception of ordinary objects. So let's start with the first slide. The thing doesn't think. It will before. I think it's just that you have to select it, right? Oh, now it works. So let's start. So the problem that we are going to talk about is the problem of relativistic change. Uh, and the problem of relativistic change apparently threatens our received view uh, concerning ordinary objects. So the idea is that we have uh, an intuitive or everyday understanding of ordinary object and the discoveries of relativity kind of threatens this way that we usually conceive ordinary objects. And, and the particular problem is exactly relativistic change. So in a word, relativistic change is this fact that 3D shapes are, uh, are frame relative within relativity theory. So the idea is that in some frame of reference, this computer will be computer shaped in some other, it will have another three dimensional shape. And we will see, so oh, sorry, this problem is not new, so we are not really reinventing the wheel here, but this problem has already been discussed by other, a number of philosophers like uh, Gilmore. I mean, we, we, are, we are quoting Gilmore, but we have kind of discussion, me and Damiano, concerning Gilmore's paper, because we are clearly quoting the famous uh, Gilmore's paper, where in the relativistic world are we? And I'm saying famous because we always talk about it, but maybe it's not very famous for all, but it's a very famous and important paper. Read it if you don't have read it. So if you don't have read it, but the idea is that in this paper, Gilmore's is really targeting a different question, which is where in, the relativistic world are uh, three-dimensional object located. And we and when we say that Gilmore has targeted a problem similar to the ones that we had, we are referring to a particular passage in Gilmore's paper that is where he, he moves from like, well, this might take too far away, but the idea is that at a certain point in the paper, he seems to target this problem that also Balashov and more explicitly, I might say, Sati. Uh, clearly targets and offers uh, a version of this problem. So <clears throat> we will particularly work and build on Sati's formulation of the problem that is contained in his 2015 paper, uh, The Double Life of Objects, where Sati presents his ilomorphic uh, conception of objects, his quasi ilomorphic conception of object. And, and the idea is that the last in the last chapter of the book, he discussed this relativistic problem. And somehow it seems that this relativistic problem offers another reason to embrace this quasi ilomorphistic conception of material things. 
And a, part a particular thing is that in his formulation, Satic on only targets four dimensionalism. So the idea in Satic formulation is that really the view that we are targeting is not just relativity or, or ordinary object with relativity, but is relativity with four dimensionalism and a, a conception of ordinary object. So, Let's move, move on. So now we, we get to what we will do in this talk. So as we said, the problem is not new. A bunch of philosophers, among Gallia, Satic have talked about it. Satic present the problem as a problem for the 4D. What are we going to do today? So today we are going to present a new version of the problem, a new version of the problem that builds on, this, on the formulation by Satic. But in this formulation, we will actually generalize the problem, so we will show that it is not only a problem for the four-dimensionalist, but it's also a problem for the three-dimensionalist. And then we will, in some sense, undermine the perspective given by Satellite, in the sense that we will try to argue that it is possible to recover ordinary objects without going as far as embracing Sati ilomorphism. So that is, in a, in a nutshell, what we are going to do. So, but the, so let's try to give you the taste of what is the problem. So the idea is that, very briefly and very imprecisely, which is very easy for me because I'm always very imprecise, so it's, it's very good that I'm doing this part of the talk. Le Leon agrees. <laughs> but anyway, so the problem is that according to our received view of ordinary object, ordinary objects are 3D shape invariant. That means that this chair only exists if it is chair shaped. So if I tear the, the chair apart, if the chair is no longer chair shaped, it doesn't exist anymore, right? This is pretty intuitive, pretty commonly accepted, right? And then the idea is what I said before, that within relativity, 3D shapes are no longer invariant. So given different frame of reference, you will have different 3D shapes. And basically, it, the idea is that very easily we could think of a, of a, sh of a, of a frame of reference or of a foliation of space-time in a more precise way, where the chair, does not have the, the shape of a chair. So you can clearly see that we have a tension between our received view of ordinary objects according to which they are always uh, shaped, ordinarily shaped, I might say. So the chair is always chair shaped and relativity according to which the object do not always have their three dimensional shape. So let's move on. Now, clearly, this is what I was saying before. So that Gilmour, in his paper, was targeting the relativistic question. So there are two questions here. One question is, where are we located in a three-dimensional space, in a relativistic space, sorry? So how can we understand our location in relativistic space-time? And then there is a related question, somehow overlapping more than, I mean, it is overlapping, it is related, but it is related, but the relation in case is overlap, is overlap. So our overlap, overlapping question that is, what, given the discoveries of relativity, what happened to our ordinary objects? And this is the question that we are targeting. Clearly, they are overlapping. As Damiano will show, will show or will argue afterwards, answering to our question might give us answer also to the other question. This is a way to show that the two are indeed overlapping, but it is important to remark that they are two different and separating questions. So they are not the same question. Move on, so let's present the problem. So clearly, again, we are following Satin, and it is in laying out the, the problem, Satin presents some principle. Now, to be fair to Satin, we are not present 
exactly like exactly mean the identical same principle like written in the same way i think i think they are a bit different right right I mean, so there, there are some little differences but the idea is that substantially they are the same principle so we're just i think we are just proposing as a slight generalization maybe somewhere but but the core idea it's the same so we are really building on sati construct of the problem and and so the idea what what I, what I will do now is to present the principle pre relativistically as it were maybe explaining them a little bit maybe showing maybe saying the motivation for them if it is needed and then i will well will add it over to damiano for the relativity part or as i would call it the difficult part but <laughs> And anyway, so let's start with the principle. So the first principle is ordinary existence. Basically, the idea is that well, there are ordinary objects, right? So we clearly now th this might not see might not seem as an important principle, but it is because someone could could easily say there are no ordinary objects, but the idea is that there are ordinary objects and that we would like to explain them. So the idea is that we don't want to offer a revisionary metaphysics of ordinary objects are there, such that ordinary objects do not exist, but we would like to render somehow compatible ordinary object with cutting edge physics. So that, that, is, that is the ultimate goal, that is the ultimate goal. So to achieve that goal, we need to assume that there are some ordinary objects, right? And then the second principle is k invariance. That is exactly what I said before. So if an object is a K, where a K is a kind, but clearly, so in the case of the chair, this particular chair, the kind is chair or chair kind. And so the idea is that, well, the chair only exists if it is a chair. If it is not a chair anymore, it doesn't exist, but the chair is just an example, it could be me. So I, I exist only if I am a human being. When I cease to be a human being and I'm dead, I don't exist anymore, hopefully. <clears throat> so, and then, and then we have K dependence. So the idea here is really that clearly being a K, this is my way of thinking, of thinking about it. I'm not sure that Damianos agree, but the idea is that being a K really is instantiating a number of different properties. So we could think of being a K as some sort of conjunctive property. And clearly one of the consequences is that you must be K-shaped, right? Where K-shaped clearly doesn't refer to a singular specific shape, because for example, there are many shapes for a chair to be a chair, but to a, like a family of shape. So the idea is that if the chair exists, then it is a chair. And then if it is a chair, then it has some chair shape. And this is K-dependence. I don't even remember how, how, how you level this, this principle. Yeah. And then we have the existence, which is, well, I mean, very, very, very easy, easy, I would say. So the idea is that O, an object O exists at T, if and only if it has a stage at T. Here, I would like to make a remark that I, would, I, I should have done afterwards, but I would anticipate it, it is the idea that here, we are not assuming that the stage is a temporal part. So a stage could also be the object itself. So the idea is that these follow if both quadridimensionalism or three-dimensionalism are, are, are in place. So the idea is that in the case of three-dimensionalism, clearly this is a true wisdom because O will exist at T just on, even only if it has O as a stage at T, well, the stage will just be O. So O exists at T, if and only if O exists at T, that is a tautology, and it's always true. Whereas in the case of four dimensionalism, that just, you know, temporal parts, and that is a consequence, that you still have that as a consequence of four dimensionalism. And then we have this in T instantiation, which is clearly, a con I mean, it's similar to the previous principle, and it just said that if, O is, a, is, is F at T, if and only if the stage at T of O is F. And again, this is 
given that, that we are not pulling any metaphysical weight on stage, this is true for both for dimensionalism and three-dimensionalism for the same reason that I said before. Some remarks. So we have a theorem that can be derived from the previous consequences that is from the previous principle side that is always okay if and only if O exists at T. If O exists at T, then O is K shaped at T, and you can and you can see that it is a concept yeah. of K variance and K dependence. And then well, we have the, the standard definition of a stage. Uh, given by, I think this was Sider, for example, but, but you can see that it is a very lightweight, uh, not, not really Sider, right? But similar to the one yeah. given by Sider. So, so it's actually mine. It's, 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 I can't <laughs> learn it. <laughs> so, that, that's why I see. That's why it's bad, probably. No, no it's not bad. bad. So it works. But anyways, it, it is a lightweight, it, it, is, it is to give a lightweight notion of, of, of stage that can be accommodated both by the thing itself and both by a temporal part. So that we understand what we are talking about when we are talking about stage. And then, yes, that, that is just what I said before. And so I think it's the, the time has come for the Mian. Okay, good. So. So far, basically, Alessandro has uh, reviewed, presented us some principles that are supposed to follow from our ordinary conception of objects, right? They, hopefully, they didn't strike you as uh, anything weird. They seem to be trivialities, right? Obviously true. Um, they concern the, con the connection between uh, being an entity of a given kind and having a certain shape or existing at a time and having a certain stage at that time, a stage being either a temporal part or the object itself in case of three-dimensionalism. The point is that once one introduces some elements of relativity, some problems are supposed to follow from exactly those principles that seem to be trivial. So uh, to see this, let us in indeed introduce some elements of relativity. And uh, we probably can actually discuss about these problems, present these problems, by just introducing two elements of them. The first one is what we usually call unitism. Very briefly, because I expect uh, most of the people in the audience to know what unitism is. So unitism is basically a view about the relationship between uh, and the nature of space and time. Uh, unitism is supposed to replace the ordinary conce conception of space and time, which is in the slide, the ordinary conception, which is usually called separatism. According to this ordinary conception of space and time, there is a, a thing we call space, it's three-dimensional, it's composed by space points, mm? and collections of those space points create sp spatial regions that can be extended to a certain extent. And then there is, on the other hand, time, which can be seen as a one-dimensional line, which is composed by instants, which are pointy, just like space, po space points are. And um, of course, collections of instants can be seen as forming what we usually call intervals, at least some of them. Uh, what is the relationship between space and time under separatism? Well, the idea is that um, space exists in time and we can actually find the same three-dimensional space at all instants of time. Okay, This is the relationship between the two. This is the ordinary conception of space and time. And I would say that once relativity is in place, many philosophers believe we should discard this view in favor of another one which is called, indeed, unitism. According to unitism, there is a, a <coughs> manifold, a four-dimensional manifold called the space-time. In um, space-time is composed by space-time points. So there are points there as well. There are space-time points. And if it is at all possible, because it is not real, if it is at all possible to recover something that corresponds to instance of time and points of space, inside uh, the four-dimensional space-time, then uh, the instants are going to correspond to a so-called 
hyperplane of simultaneous space-time points. You see, it's uh, actually indicated in the slide, right? This is supposed to be an instant. It's basically a collection or a neurological sum of simultaneous space-time points. And if there is anything that corresponds to a space point um, in 4D space-time, this is going to correspond to a line that traverses space-time along the, we might say, temporal axis. Okay? So, first element of relativity to, to keep in mind, we replace all the separatism with new unity. Good. And the second element from the relativity we need is indeed the phenomenon of relativistic change or shape relativity that Alessandro was mentioning before. The basic idea is that under relativity, the spatial shape of an object varies across frames of objects. Okay? So it might be that, um, again, an object has a given shape in one frame of reference, and it is maybe a bit elongated or shrunk in another uh, frame of reference. Um, right. And uh, more generally, it is possible that in one frame of reference, a given object has a certain shape, whereas in another frame of reference at a given time, it is going to have a different uh, shape. Just to illustrate how things go here, well, consider the rectangular four-dimensional object here, which is the one in light blue. Consider an instant of time. You remember it is the hyperplane of space-time points, of simultaneous space-time points, um, under a given frame, because I hope that you are, or are aware that actually the relation of simultaneity is relative to a frame under relativity. Okay. Now, if you consider a time in a frame, well, this time is going to intersect the object, and the blue part is going to be to correspond to the three-dimensional shape of the object at that time in that frame. Okay. Now, again, as I said, given relativity, of course, you might actually be working in different frames of reference, and this distinction is going to amount to also a difference in the planes of simultaneity, right? Simultaneity is relative to a frame uh, when relativity is introduced. So consider a different frame of reference, uh, F star in this case, and an instant in that frame of, of reference. In that case, as I said, the simultaneity plane is going to intersect the object at a different angle, so to speak. And so the shape of the object at that time in that frame is not going to be the blue one, but rather the red one. Okay? Good. So in principle, this is an illustration of the fact that under different frames, different times, the same object apparently seems to have different or can have different uh, shapes. Now, in some cases, this variation is not so substantial, right? It all depends on the different parameters that we are considering. But the point to realize here is that, at least in some cases, the variation is going to be huge. To see this, let us consider the second case. You have the same object. You have now a time, T2, under the first frame of reference, F which is basically the last time in which the object exists, right? The shape is going to be the same as before, roughly. But what happens if we consider the object from the different perspective of the second frame of reference, F star, and from a given instant in particular, namely T2 F star here, OK? So what happens is that the instant is going to intersect the object only at the corner, at the very corner of the object itself. Therefore, the object and in that instance, under that frame of reference, is going to have actually the shape of a point. Okay? So you see, the difference here is really radical, because under one frame of reference, you have what might amount to a three-dimensional object, which, under a different frame of reference, turns out to be just a point 
in space. Okay. Um, good. Um, this is basically the phenomenon. So let us try to see more precisely how this creates a problem, even though I think that you now have uh, at least the intuition of why this might be problematic in light of the previous principle. Let us indeed go back to the previous principles, right? Now, of course, the previous principles have been presented by Alessandro before in a non-relativistic, in a pre-relativistic setting, right? Uh, you remember that the principles were, for example, attributing properties relative to F time, but we now know that we should rather attribute those properties relative to uh, times under frames, okay? So basically, this is the formulation of the new principles in light of this idea. Hmm? Okay. Um, right. So here are the new principles, the revised ones. Uh, so the first one, of course, remains as it is. There is at least uh, one ordinary object. In our case, specific case, it is supposed to be a chair. Okay. And um, here is the first reformulated principle. So if anything is a chair, then if that thing exists at a time under the frame, it's going to be a chair at that time under that, that frame. Okay. And if O is a chair at that time, then O is going to have the relevant shape at that time, okay? If a chair exists at a given time under a frame, it should have one of the shapes under the family of eligible shapes that the chair can have. Um, and this is the fourth principle revised uh, in light of relativity. O exists at a time under a frame, if and only if it has a stage at the time under that frame. In uh, uh, P5, is going to say that O is chair shaped at the time under the frame, if and only if the stage of the object at the time is going to have the shape. Okay? Good. Now, we have all elements, basically, to see where the problem lies. Because on the one end, considering what we have just said, we would be led to say that if we consider the corner slice of the object here, I'm going to start calling it corner slice, um, under the time T2 under F star, we are going to conclude in light of P4 that the chair is going to exist because there is a stage of the chair at the time, no matter how small it is. But of course, if it exists, it must be a chair in light of P1 and P2, right? And in light of P3, it must also be chair shaped. But on the other hand, we have contrasting reasons because at the time P2, under F star, the chair is arguably not chair shaped, right? Because the shape of the chair at the relevant time is going to be basically the shape of the stage. And the shape of the stage is a point. Therefore, the chair is going to be pointy at the given time under the relevant frame. So we have basically a contradiction. Um, so this is basically the problem of relativistic change. Um, in his book, Zatik uh, considers several possible replies, several possible modifications of the principle or revisions of the principles, for example, and gives reasons to reject them all. And finally, uses this as um, a sort of argument, as Alessandro mentioned, in favor of this hylomorphic um, view that is supposed to take care of, of this problem. Um, again, the spirit of this talk is to try to see whether we have to go that far, whether we really have to embrace hylomorphism in order to take care of this problem, or whether there are other ways, in particular other ways that somehow uh, take seriously those principles uh, without actually embracing hylomorphism. And the punchline is that we believe, perhaps, that 
both four-dimensionalism and three-dimensionalism have indeed the resources of taking care of the problem of relativistic change without uh, going that far and embracing hylomorphism. Um, good, so let us start, on the other hand, um, with a reassessment before introducing the first possible solution that we are going to discuss tonight, if we have the time to do this. Because indeed, it might be interesting to consider the situation from a different perspective. So, so far, we have given for granted that there was a thing that was supposed to be the word volume of the chair, which is basically this thing here. Okay? This is supposed to be the word volume of the chair. It's the four dimensional location, in a sense of location, of the chair. Like we have given for granted that there is such a thing, and we have discussed about um, instance intersecting that word volume and so on and so forth. But an interesting question is how is the word volume of the given chair identified? In, um, indeed, so far we have just simply taken for granted there was one. But I hope to show you that it is not so straightforward that there is one. Hmm? Um, indeed, the idea is that asking the question of what is the word volume of a given chair from the perspective of different frames of reference might yield different results. Okay? Um, in some extreme cases, for example, in the case of short lived chair, it might even be possible that in some frames there is absolutely nothing ever recognizable as a chair. Let me try to show you um, how this new perspective is going to yield different results. So let us again try to um, look at things from the perspective of two different frames. Let us start with the usual one, F. Suppose that we are looking uh, to the middle of the room, and suppose that we are in this situation. Well, in this situation, we look in the middle of the room, and we would say that at the instant T0, F, there is absolutely nothing in the center of the room. Okay? Then somehow, there is, of course, a simplification here, but we think it is not so important. A chair starts to exist. And from the perspective of that frame at T1, we see immediately a chair appearing in the middle of the room. Okay, again, we are simplifying. It's of course a thought experiment, um, but here it is. From this, from the perspective of this frame, um, what we are going to see is a chair appearing in its entire. In the later times, again, we look in the center of the room and we find the chair until T3, which is the last instant in which we are going to see a chair, and then we are going to see nothing anymore at later instants. Okay. Let us now try to see what happens from the perspective of the second <laughs> frame of reference. What happens actually is, as I indicated before, that at the beginning, under F star at P0, there is absolutely nothing in the center of the room. After a while, something will appear, but that something is going to be pointy, it's going to be small, it's not going to have this, the, share, the, the shape of a chair. So nobody would actually say, be pushed to say, that there is a chair in the middle of the room, okay? So there is something, but definitely that thing is not a chair. Later on, at some point, again, I said there is a simplification here, but at some point, something will indeed, so gradually appear, and appear to be indeed a chair. So the person looking in the middle of the room is going to say, yes, now there is a chair. Um, and this is going to continue for a while, until indeed we get to the situation in which um, you see the chair gradually disappearing until it is a point. And at that point, of course, uh, the person is going to say, yeah, there is something in the room, something pointy, but it is not a chair anymore, because indeed a uh, chair cannot be a point. OK, and at the end, there is nothing at all. OK, good. So if we try to put these two perspectives together, um, what happens 
is that we are going to see that there seem to be uh, somehow two word volumes for the chat, right? From the first perspective, the word, word volume of the chat is going to be the blue thing there. Whereas from the perspective of the second frame of reference, the word volume of the chat is going to be something different, more precisely, that thing here. And here. Good, thanks. It's going to be difficult to actually cover everything, but we're going to try. You can take five more if you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you see, it is not so obvious anymore the assumption that there was one thing which was supposed to be the word volume of the chat. So what should we say? Well, this case is actually discussed by Satig himself and in some manuscripts by Halvorsson and Fine as well. Um, what they consider to be a possible lesson from uh, uh, this case, especially Fine and Zaptig, is that um, actually the same four-dimensional object, the same chair, might actually have more than one word volume. Okay? So in this case, it actually has two, but of course, there are going to be many more depending on the frames of reference that we consider. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the first possible conclusion. There are several different options indeed. One is indeed to say that um, the work, the work volume of a chair and its existence is going to be relative to frames of reference, and therefore there are several of them. Hmm? However, this possibility has actually massive philosophical consequences. Just to mention one, but there are many more. If we accept this, we are going to end up accepting that four-dimensionalism is committed to the possibility of multi-location, to the possibility of a single object having more than one exact location. This, if you know a little bit about persistence and uh, location theory, is indeed a massive philosophical concept. Um, also, this somehow sidesteps an important question, an important question that is worth highlighting. We have so far, by saying that the same chair has several word volumes, taken for granted that what we see in one frame of reference is numerically identical to what we see in another frame of reference. It might be actually the case, but the question is, what makes the chair in one frame the same chair as what is in the other frame? Huh? We might call this the problem of cross-frame identity conditions. Hmm? But, um, right. This is a question that is worth asking in its own right. But we are now going to um, present an alternative to the claim that the same object has several word volumes. A different lesson that can be drawn from the case that we have discussed before. We call it the many chess interpretation of uh, uh, relativistic chains. The many chess interpretation. Uh, by the name, I guess you already uh, kind of seen where we are going. So let us consider the situation again from a meteorological perspective. Okay. So the chair in F and the chair in F star, of course, overlap significantly. But there is also a meteorological difference between them, right? The so-called corner slices are going to be part of the chair, the four-dimensional object that is a chair in F, but not part of the chair in F star. And also from a locative point of view, one might say, there is a difference there, right? Because the chair in F and the chair in F star seem to have different exact locations. Good. So the many chairs interpretation takes these meteorological and locative differences at face value. The idea is that there are going to be many, as many chairs as there are frames that yield chairs which are meteorologically different or locatively different. Okay? Um, we indeed answer in that way the problem of uh, cross-frame identity. Uh, by saying that the identity criterion can be meriological in extension terms of locative in terms of functionality. So 
x and y are going to be identical if and only if they have the exact the same exact of course in this case the massive metaphysical consequences are avoided right we don't have a multi-location anymore and there are further advantages that we will describe shortly if we are trying for them but i guess that at least some of you are actually thinking about a clear objection here the clear objection is that we would actually take there to be only one chair, right? And we would actually be talking as if there were only one single chair then, right? Not as if there were many chairs. This is one possible objection. Um, I'm gonna tackle it, but before I just wanted to say, you might have also another objection in mind. And the objection might be something like, um, having to do with ontological parsimony, right? This seems not to be an ontologically parsimonious idea, given that there are going to be many chairs there in place of one. I just wanted to tackle briefly this second uh, worry first, just by pointing out that this uh, um, plurality of chairs is already something that follows from four-dimensionalism, pre-relativistically speaking. Right. If one is a four-dimensionalist and uh, considers the four-dimensional chair, then of course there is going to be a chair, this one, but also another chair, which is this one, and also another chair, which is this, this one. And there are many ways of actually dissecting the four-dimensional object and getting numerically different chairs. So the four-dimensionalist is already committed to a plurality of chairs. Hmm? Uh, but let us go back to this objection. Why do we still talk as if there were only one single chair in the room, right? Maybe we are trading. We are looking at the chair from different perspectives, and I might actually buy the chair from you uh, because you claim uh, the chair for your own, and I want to buy it. So we consider it to be a single chair. How can we take care of this? And here is an idea. The situation here is reminiscent of an old problem. The problem, the so-called problem of the many. So let me briefly tell you um, what is the problem of the many. Okay. Now suppose that you again look at our room um, and you see uh, a friend of yours, Bob, inside this room. Okay. And you don't see anything else. And I ask you, how many human beings are there in the room where Bob is? Well, we would all answer only one, Bob, right? But if you look closer, then you might be led to believe that there are many more human beings there, okay? Now consider, for example, those different parts of Bob, such as Bob minus his hands, or Bob minus his feet, or Bob minus his hair, okay? All those are proper parts of Bob, and therefore are numerically different from Bob. Hmm? But they are arguably all human beings, right? Because, of course, there are human beings without hair, there are human beings without hands, and so on and so forth. It's not because something doesn't have hands that it's not a human being anymore. So, there again, we speak as if there were only one human being in the room, Bob, but there are also reasons to believe that there are many human beings there, namely some parts of Bob. Of course, there, there is a problem, but there are also several possible solutions, and we can actually borrow solutions from there and apply them in this case. Here is a classical solution. It is actually a solution that um, is due to David Lewis. Um, his, his solution is the partial identity solution. So Lewis says that in ordinary contexts, when we say that there is only one chair or there is only one person, we are not counting by identity because indeed there are several persons which are numerically different in the room and several chairs, but we count by almost identical. In other terms, the many chairs or the many human beings are, he says, almost identical because they overlap significantly. 
This is the reason why we count them in ordinary contexts as only one. Okay? So we can actually do the same here, right? So the different shells in the relativistic case are numerically different, strictly speaking, but they overlap significantly, and that's why we count them as one in ordinary contexts. Um, I, I'm going to just briefly mention, mention that um, we are also exploring the possibility that this many chess interpretation uh, takes care also of the other overlapping problem, namely, namely Gilmore's, Gilmore's location question. Um, but maybe I should skip here so to let you time to discuss the other solution. Hmm? We can maybe go back to this later. Yeah, the five months, minutes of one. Four, five minutes. Okay. Oh, that's more than enough. So Damiano has just exposed the, the cool solution. I'm going for the boring one, which is mine. So the idea basically is roughly that. We usually try to identify ordinary objects with relativistic objects. So the idea is that we usually take relativity to be about like the chair, right? As we did before, like we 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 draw a, a, a frame of reference and we said that that was the world, like the 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 path of the of the chair, right? That's what we did. But, but the idea, but that, and that is problematic, as we saw, because then we have the, the relativistic object, the objects that are in relativity, have this feature that they have different 3D shapes based on the frame of reference that we are considering. So the idea that I had is, well, what if we don't take to be ordinary object, the object that undergo this kind of change, which is not a very super smart intuition. So the idea is basically to say, well, we have relativistic objects that undergo this kind of relativistic change, and then we have ordinary objects. So the idea is, well, when we are looking to ontology or to metaphysics, we have the fundamental entity that are these relativistic objects. And then from these relativistic objects, we get with some metaphysical relation the ordinary object. So the idea is that the chair is not really what, what relativity is about. Well, it is in some sense because the object from which the on which the chair depends on is about relativity. And so that's the idea. Basically, the idea is that we have this relativistic, we have this the relativistic, we have this relativistic object, and when the stage at Tf, so at the, at the time relative to a frame instantiate the relevant K properties that we have seen before. So it is K shaped and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Then there is a chair. So the idea is that as, as someone who is accustomed with metaphysics could have, have easily understand, we are taking it to be also a sufficient condition. So this is going to be some sort of grounding relation. So we, we can say that the, exi the, the, the existence of the relativistic object plus the fact that it instantiates at a certain time some k property grounds the fact that an ordinary object exists in that. So the idea is again we can recover ordinary objects by taking that to be fundamentally the object of which about of which relativity talks so that are these relativistic objects and then we can say that there are also and we can also get ordinary object not exactly for free but for a good price uh, as via this metaphysical relationship like grounding now so far so good anglophone would say but there are still things to be said so there are two things that I mentioned in the slide before, but I didn't read it again. So the idea is that there are two questions to be answered. First of all, what is this metaphysical relationship? And the second is the um, persistence profile of the object, of the ordinary object. Because clearly, as I said before, and any state, the, the, the instantiation in the existence of the relativistic object at any given time would be a sufficient condition for there to be the chair. But then clearly the question is, it is always the same chair or not? For example, this is a question, right? This is a metaphysical question that we need to answer once we are presenting the account. And so we have two possibilities because for dimensionalism, 
I thought that it was not a possibility because in that case, we would still have that. It is the sum of all the stages and then you would still have the corner slice problem or some form of it because, well, that's maybe for, for the question time. But so the idea is that we could have both three-dimensionalism of exurantism for ordinary objects. So the idea is that you would have four dimensionalism or then durantism for the fundamental things and then having either endu either endurantism or, or exdurantism that is the stage view. So at any stage, there are many, there is a, a chair that is numerically distinct from the, the, the chairs at the other stages. So in one sense, we would still have many chairs, but in a very different sense than the one that Damiano suggested. And the other question that is important to ask is concerned the metaphysical relation. So I suggested it could be metaphysical grounding. And clearly in both these answers that I'm gonna get, that I'm gonna give, you will get some sort of metaphysical dependence going on, but you could, you could say two things. So here, one is that the chair that you get is still a part of the object. So it's still a temporal part if you wish. So clearly if you take this route, you will go out of there. So the idea is that this answer that I give, so distinguish relativistic object from ordinary object could be an answer, whatever your theory of persistence is. So either if you're a three-dimensionalist or a four-dimensionalist, if you think, if you want the chair to be a part of the relativistic object, then it would be a temporal part. And then, it, and then you would be kind of pushed towards four-dimensionalism. But the other possibility is that the chair is a distinct object. So it's not a part. Now, clearly, clearly, now I love Mariology, so I know that you would have, you would need some not classical Mariology for having as a consequence that the chair is not a part of the of the object, but you could work it out. But the, the idea is that you could work it out without going as far as being an ilomor, an ilomorphist. So the idea is that yes, you wouldn't be a classical Mariologist, but maybe kind of similar. Uh, <clears throat> yes. And so this, this is basically the, the, my, 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 my proposal or our proposal, the second proposal, the boring proposal, that is a nice name, I think. So the idea is that, the idea is that, well, relativity says that there is 3D shape, 3D shape change, 3D shape relativity, like there is the relativity of simultaneity. Well, we simply say that that 3D shape relativity does not concern ordinary object, but only relativistic object, and then we get ordinary object from relativistic object. So that is the idea. Oh. Yes, and so the idea is that clearly you can, there are, there are a lot of marriages that are possible. Some, as it usually happens in metaphysics where there are a lot of marriages that are possible, not all marriages are equally good. And, and, and if you like some, the, some metaphysical theory more than others, clearly you will push towards some theories rather than some, some marriages rather than others. But I would, I would say that this is metaphysics and how it works, but maybe I'm wrong what I know. So uh, yeah, this is what I just said. Yes, the, 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 uh, I basically said that it works. It works. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and yeah, so the idea is that in this case, we basically will restrict uh, principle P4 that you would probably remember. So the idea is that uh, O exists at TF, if and only if it has a stage at TF, and we are basically, in a way, conditionally conditionalizing on the on the on the state on the times at which it exists by saying that well, the relativistic object does not only need to have a stage there, but the stage need to be of a particular kind, need to instantiate particular properties. So somehow it can be seen as a restriction of the principle, even though for the relative, for the ordinary object, the principle still holds. Because clearly, I mean, regardless of what you think about stages, if it has a stage there, it will exist because it means that the stage of the relativistic object as the relevant property at that TF. Yeah. So we still get in some sense, or in the very interesting sense, principle. So to wrap up, let's conclude, we have this card, let, let's conclude and let's wrap up all we have, all we have said. So we have presented 
a new formulation of the of the problem of relativistic change for ordinary objects. So basically, we have shown that I don't remember what I would have write, but that's not important. So so we have we have presented a, a, a new formulation of the problem of relativistic change for ordinary objects. So we have shown basically that there is this tension that had, that had already been shown by other in the previous literature, but we always shown that these works both for 3D and 4D. So both the four dimensionalist and the three dimensionalist that cares about ordinary object have a problem because there is a, there is a tension between our ordinary, with our residue about ordinary object and relativity. And then we have also displayed some solution. And here the point is that contra satig, we have we have shown that we can solve this problem without embracing perspectival anomorphism. So that's all. I think I I I was perfectly on the five minutes. And thank you for your attention.